Hello and welcome to today's uh, tutorial. Today we will be talking about Bertolt Brecht, his epic theatre and Wolfram Dung's effect. Now to understand about Brecht's theatre, one should look at one of his poems. It is a poem named Questions from a Worker Who Reads, which was published in 1935. The poem reads where the worker says, Who built Thebes of the seven gates? In the books you will read the names of kings. Did the kings haul up the lumps of rock and Babylon many times demolished? Who raised it up so many times? In what houses of gold glittering did its builders live? Where the evening that the great wall of China was finished did the masons go? Great Rome is full of triumphal arches. Who recited them? Sorry, who erected them? Over whom did the Caesars triumph? Had Byzantium much praised in song, only palaces for its inhabitants? Even in fabled Atlantis, the night that the ocean engulfed it, the drowning still cried out for the slaves. The young Alexander conquered India. Was he alone? Caesar defeated the Gauls. Did he not even have a cook with him? Philip of Spain wept when his armada went down. Was he the only one to weep? Frederick II won the Seven Years' War. Who else won it? Every page a victory. Who cooked the feast for the victors? Every ten years a great man. Who paid the bill? So many reports, so many questions. So this is the voice of a worker who is alienated from his work. This is the voice of a producer who is alienated from his production. That someone is producing but the appropriation is not done by that same person. For example, within capitalism we see that within the means of production, for example a factory, the worker creates the product or the commodity but is himself alienated away from the product or commodity because it is appropriated by the capitalist. So here the worker says essentially that it was me who built the seven gates, it was me who built the Taj Mahal, it was me who made the Babylon, it was me who made Great Rome, it was me who made Byzantium, it was me everywhere. Workers create the world, but the acknowledgement is not there. Just like Shelley had said that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, similarly we can say that the workers are the unacknowledged producers of the world. <coughs> to understand the nature of art, it can do justice to quote Leon Trotsky, the Russian revolutionary whose name uh, was Lev Davidovich Bronstein. Trotsky was a name which he took up later on. Now, Trotsky says that art, it is said, is not a mirror but a hammer. It does not reflect its shapes. What do we mean by it? That here the artist has a definite role to play. And this role is to find out about the oppression which goes on in society and not just to interpret but to change. For example, it is very Marxist in nature. Marx in his thesis of Feuerbach, in his 11th thesis of Feuerbach said that philosophers have merely interpreted the world but the main task is to change it. Now, <coughs> is theatre linked with politics? According to Dr. Kuntal Mukhabadhar, yes. In his book, Theatre and Politics, he says, Politics is one of the unavoidable facts of human existence. Everyone is involved in some fashion at some time in some kind of political system. This has been claimed by Robert A. Dahl in his Modern Political Analysis. Now, if politics is inescapable, so are the consequences of politics. 
In this perspective, we can search for a definition of political theatre and find out to what extent theatre may be political. A theatre is political if it is concerned with the state, government or politics. A theatre is political if it intentionally takes sides in politics. It is actively engaged in political activities. Then a theatre is political. <clears throat> now, here are some luminaries of political theatre. Mayer, Hold and Eisenstein. Uh, well, if you want to talk about them, we can understand that uh, in the years following the Russian Revolution, Mayer, Hold and Eisenstein, they adopted a wide range of 19th century theatre forms in their experimental work uh, towards a new kind of theatre. Uh, Mayor Hole can be said to use agitational posters even to a great extent. In his theatres, actual political slogans, citations and portraits were introduced. Alright, so uh, another, an another luminary can be said to be uh, Ostrovsky and Stanislavsky. Now both of them, Ostrovsky and Stanislavsky, they were very two eminent personalities of the Russian theatre who wished to create a new people's theatre which would draw the middle and the lower classes to form a theatre not of bourgeois elements but truly democratic in its widest sense. To both of them theatre is a representation of the people on the development of their socialist consciousness and it is a link between the individual and the collective or group which forms a vital feature or the new theatre in Russia after 1917. <coughs> Roma Rola can also be <coughs> an example. Uh, Roma Rola wanted to set up the people's theatre in the lines of socialism and social revolution. Although he did not belong to any political party, he was much influenced in his younger days by French syndicalism, a sort of anarcho-communism, which negating the need for a centralized state power priest for regional control by trade unions and all spheres of life. He was a renowned critic. Now, Erwin Piscator was another eminent theatre personality. He was of the opinion that theatrical art is not only a means to an end, but that end is clearly political. Augusto Boal, who created the theatre of the oppressed. Now, what is the theatre of the oppressed? According to Boal, theatre is a weapon and a very efficient weapon. The ruling classes strive to take permanent hold of the theatre and utilize it as a tool for domination. The oppressed classes also use theatre as a weapon of liberation. So we can see that class plays a very important role in all the props advocated by these luminaries. What are classes? A class is defined as your relationship to the means of production. Now, when we talk about Bertolt Brecht, we have to understand that from the very first days, Brecht's theatre began to be very instructive, not asking the audience to enjoy, but rather to think and understand the social context. In his own words, uh, oil, inflation, war, social struggles, the family, religion, wheat, the meat market, all became subjects for theatrical representation. Choruses enlightened the spectator about facts unknown to him. Right and wrong courses of action were shown. People were shown who knew what they were doing and others who did not. So Brecht's philosophy is a philosophy of instruction. <coughs> so uh, when we come to epic theatre, these points must be remembered. Now, the question which Epic Theatre asks is, is, is it a theatre for pleasure or is it just a theatre for instruction? And while negating the former, it asserts the latter. Epic gesture, I mean, Epic Theatre is gestural. Uh, the extent to which it can be literary in the traditional sense is a separate issue, obviously. But uh, this gesture is its main raw material. Epic Theatre does not focus on a plot. Epic theatre focuses on a narrative. Epic theatre doesn't want the audience to sit back, relax and enjoy. The kind of theatre uh, he wants the audience to play and 
active role in understanding the social context. It wants the audience to ask questions. Now, uh, to talk about this alienation effect, Brecht bombards the fourth wall. Now, the stage, now the stage you have to understand begins to tell a story. The narrator was no longer missing along with the fourth wall. All right. Not only did the background adopt an attitude to the events on the stage by big screens recalling other simultaneous events elsewhere, by projecting documents which confirmed or contradicted what the characters said by concrete and intelligible figures, to accompany abstract conversations, by figures and sentences to support mind transactions whose sense was unclear, but the actors too refrained from going over wholly into their role remaining detached from the character they were playing and clearly invite criticism of him. So the spectator was no longer in any way allowed to submit to an experience uncritically. You always had to be critical. Now, <clears throat> to give you an example, uh, let's see, uh, for example, say the dramatic theater spectator and the epic theater spectator. What would be the particular attitudes of the dramatic theater spectator? A dramatic theater spectator would say, yes, I have felt like that, just like me. It's only natural. It'll never change. The sufferings of this man appall me because they are inescapable. That's great art. But this will not be the attitude of the epic theater spectator. He would say, I'd never have thought about it. That's not the way. That's extraordinary, hardly believable. It's got to stop. All right. So it is not asking you to be hypnotized in the willing suspension of disbelief, but it's asking you to think critically. Bhabo, bhabo, practice karo. That is what the alienation effect is asking you to do. It is asking you to remain alienated from the stage. <coughs> Therefore, it attempts to combat emotional manipulation by replacing it with a surprising jolt. Rather than investing in or becoming their characters, they might emotionally step away with a very skillful self-critique. The director could break the fourth wall and expose the technology of the theater to the audience in amusing ways. Hence, the social jest is an exaggerated gesture, but it critically exposes the social relationship or power imbalance. Thank you and uh, for more videos, please like and subscribe. Uh, I will follow this uh, video later on with uh, what is Marxism and uh, how Marxism inspired Bertolt Brecht. Thank you very much.